Okay. Uh, welcome to what we're calling the class on discovering, understanding, and using your spiritual gift. For those of you uh, watching by way of video here, a small live audience, students, class. But uh, for those of you that are here, we have a YouTube ministry. And uh, we're about six months old, and we're getting a lot of people coming to our site from around the world. I'm just learning more and more about YouTube. Uh, some of our other more technical people are helping us with this. So uh, we want to make this available to them as well. For those of you that are here in person, if you have uh, questions about what we're studying, we'll leave time after every session to have you ask those. happy to try to answer them. Most of the material I'll be sharing is by a ministry called Institute of Basic Life Principles. Uh, the founder and director is Bill Gothard. Not Bill Gaither, the singer. This is Bill Gothard. And uh, a lot of this will be based on this publication. He has entitled Understanding Spiritual Gifts. For those of you that are here, uh, you can look at this if you haven't one already during the breaks and see if you want to purchase one. These are five dollars and we'd be happy to uh, order those, get those for you. You just have to uh, give us the five dollars and we'll take it from there. We're also going to make this available on CDs. So uh, if you're watching this and you would be interested in purchasing the CDs and or the study guide, again, let us know. Yeah, if you're watching this by way of video, Phone us at area code 616-970-4432 or email us Daniel Scud at sbcglobal.net or uh, write us at ICPM PO Box 7 Granville, Michigan 49468. Okay, that's the advertisements. <laughs> But let's, uh, let's dedicate this whole uh, class to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to once again study your word. Thank you for what I consider these hidden jewels in your word. We thank you for brother in the Lord, your servant Bill Gothard, who dug these gems out, these jewels out of your scriptures many years ago and uh, put together this teaching, which I know has benefited me and benefited uh, thousands of others, maybe millions. But even just in our small ministry, many have benefited from this over the years. And so we pray that this would be beneficial to all that uh, would come under the hearing of my voice, whether by way of video or CD, or those that are here right now. As always, just get me out of the way. Uh, it's your word that's important, and your Holy Spirit that will be teaching it. And 
We pray indeed that Jesus Christ and Him alone would be glorified. He would be exalted. He alone would be worshipped and praised through this. If anyone else is on their way to join us in person, bring them safely and swiftly. And uh, we'll thank you and praise you and dedicate all this to you in Jesus' name. <laughs> Which reminds us we should probably close the door. Chuck, did you do that for me? I forgot that the bus comes periodically. That would be quite an interruption. Now we'll leave this one open so people know where we're at. I'd like to begin with a story, and I would like each one of you to participate in this. Uh oh. <laughs> it's easy. Comes. It's easy. Let's say we were here, as we are now, and a woman came in that none of us had ever met. Okay? And all of a sudden she started weeping. And so obviously she's in pain and uh, suffering. So on further discussion with her, she confesses that the reason she's so sorrowful is that she just lost her baby due to heavy cocaine use. Okay? I'm curious how each one of us, and we don't have a lot of time here, but what, what would be the first thing you would say to her? Randy, once you learned all this. She's reading what she saw. Okay. First thing that comes to your mind, what would you say? She deserved what she got. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy, the innocent baby is. Maybe okay. It's the mother's son. Chuck? Well, I would say that I'm sorry what happened, but you got to always remember your baby is with the Lord. Good. Oh, Chuck. thanks for sharing, and let's pray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, compassion, you know, and I want to know her heart, you know, she's, she's sorrowful, so, you know, I feel, at least she's repent. she seems repentant, you know, and I want to help her. Yeah, just uh, express my sorrow for her and pray with her. Good. Yeah. I mean, I would probably just tell her it's probably a good way to get closer to God, I mean, to maybe, I mean, to meet that baby one day. <coughs> Because I know it's hard, but... <coughs> yeah. Okay, good. Well, what this illustrates is, because no one was wrong here, right? right? None of these responses were wrong or right. I mean, they were all good. I should say they're all right. But perhaps you said what you said because of your spiritual gift. And this illustrates that... You can have, well, we have about 10 followers of Christ here. And you can have these different answers. And it's so important to understand not only what our gift is because of this, but what others are. Especially if we live with them, like family members, spouses, children. And then those that we work with side by side in ministry. Because it's been my experience that when ministering to people... Randy is someone I minister alongside of regularly, Chuck, Robin. <clears throat> they may wonder, and sometimes I wonder, why they don't see the same situation as I do. Same perspective. Well, it's probably because they have a different spiritual gift. And the Apostle Paul said, in 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. And I believe this subject is so important if not only we want to, again, understand our own gift and why we respond 
to certain situations the way we do, but also to understand others. I mentioned Bill Gothard. Uh, he put this together way back in 1973. And since then, there's been a, uh, a myriad of other ministries now presenting material on spiritual gifts, but in so many other ways and areas, he was a real pioneer. And uh, that's why we're using his material. And you may have seen material on your own from different ministries. I have as well. And uh, most of them are, are very good. In Romans 12, we have the seven gifts that are listed. I'm just curious, uh, the seven gifts there, does anyone here know what their gift is that's listed in that passage? Raise your hand. Two. Okay, good. This uh, will be profitable, hopefully, to the rest of you here. We'll look at this in more detail in Romans 12 in, in a few moments, but that's where the seven gifts are listed. Bill says here that one of the basic keys to harmony in marriage and the local church is understanding each other's spiritual gift. He asked the question, how many of you know what your spouse's or your children's gifts are or your parents? Because that is important as well, like I said earlier. He asked this question, what would you think of a person who received a very special gift but never opened it? Each Christian has been given a spiritual gift from the Lord. And it is said, I've been in ministry 40 years, that uh, many Christians don't ever discover what their sp spiritual gift is. And I hope that after you're here today or see this on video that you're excited, as I am, even after all these years, about uh, this teaching. Now it's interesting that spiritual gifts are not discussed in Romans or 1 Corinthians until chapter 12 in each of those books. Because, as Bill brings out here, the Holy Spirit who wrote the scriptures, and Paul was the author there, needed chapters 1 through 11 in each of those books to resolve moral conflicts and create a genuine desire for God's best. He goes on to say here, unresolved moral conflicts will not only hinder a person from discover and discovering and properly using their spiritual gift, but may also result in confusion on what is presented about the gifts. There is a lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts, isn't there? That's why there's whole different denominations. Because of what one denomination might emphasize about the Holy Spirit more than another denomination. So there is a lot of misunderstanding. At least I hope this material clears up some misunderstanding about spiritual gifts. So this is what we're going to look at in the course of this uh, class today. We're going to look at the introduction and understanding spiritual gifts. Then, of course, discovering what your gift is. And then how to use your spiritual gift. And if, it's, if what happens with you is what happened with me when I heard this material and, is, and have taught on it many times now, uh, you begin to not only learn what your gift is, but then you begin to see, wow, I think my spouse has that gift. Because that sure describes her or him or a sibling, or again, someone you work with. And that's what makes this exciting as well. Uh, as I get to know people, especially those people that I uh, work with or see on a regular basis, and I, I'm sure that they're followers of Christ, I begin to try to discern what their gift is. And sometimes it just stands out like black and white. Uh, sometimes I may know someone for years, and I really don't know what their spiritual gift is, but they display three or four of them very strongly. 
because as we go through this material, we're going to look at characteristics of each of the gifts, but also misuses. And uh, Jesus displayed all the seven gifts because he had all of them, and he displayed them perfectly, obviously, all the time because he was uh, God in the flesh. So understanding spiritual gifts. If each Christian properly understood his spiritual gift, it would not only motivate him to greater commitment and service, but also would bring a whole new excitement to the body of Christ. Now, every Christian has a spiritual gift, and it was given the moment you became a Christian. You may not have known that. Most Christians don't. In fact, most Christians, many Christians don't even know, they can't pinpoint even a date, and they don't have to, when they were converted. Uh, some people, their conversion was so dramatic, uh, like mine, that I know the time, the date, and uh, of course the location. For me, it was September 28, 1977, about 10 o'clock in the morning, in a barn out in Byron Center, Michigan. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I didn't know it then, but I was given a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift. And uh, it was only when I heard this material that I discovered what it was. Now there's great joy that comes in exercising your gift and my gift. The root word for gift in the New Testament is the Greek word charisma. We have an English word like that, charisma. But there's a Greek word. And the first part of the word, car, C-H-A-R, means joy. Charis is the word for grace, which involves God giving us the desire and power to accomplish His will, Philippians 2.13. Finding spiritual fulfillment, finding personal fulfillment in life, is only possible by developing our spiritual gift. Everyone has a desire to have a meaningful life, meaningful achievement. And of course, that only comes through the Lord, from the Lord. And certainly to understand our spiritual gift is of utmost importance if we want to find that personal fulfillment as much as possible. Now, this is very important to remember because there are denominations, there are churches that overemphasize gifts. That's why Bill brings out here, each gift, spiritual gift, is designed to build up the church, other people, the church universal. It's not for our own little plaything. And that's where so many, well, some denominations emphasize this wrongly. They think it's a personal, almost like a toy. But no. We were given a gift to minister to others. However large that sphere would be. And that's the Lord's choosing as well. Thus, failure to exercise our gift actually weakens the ministry of the body of Christ. Thus, God wants us to understand our gift. If we are to have harmony with others, spouse, children, other Christians we minister with, we must understand what their particular spiritual gift is as well. Now, up here on the overhead, we're going to look at what Bill entitles various manifestations resulting from one spiritual motivation. So this is where words are very important. Um, actually, I had the wrong one up there. I'm sorry. This is what I meant to have. There are three distinct categories under spiritual gifts. And this is based on what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. I understand this is small print, but uh, I just used Bill's material and made these overhead 
sheets for that. It says there in 1 Corinthians 12, Now concerning spiritual matters, brethren, this is the NIV version, I do not want you to be uninformed. There are varieties of gifts, there are varieties of service, and there are varieties of workings. So we're looking at three different categories here. And here they are. And we go into the Greek here to get some extra amplification, understanding. Basically, these are the three categories of all the gifts listed in the New Testament. There's motivational gifts, there's ministry gifts, and there's manifestational gifts. Now this is where Christians get confused. They mix these up. And uh, they emphasize the manifestational gifts where we should be manifest or uh, emphasizing the motivational gifts. What is the, mo what is the motivational gift? It's the basic inward drive which God places in each Christian to express his love, that is God's love. Ministries are the opportunities of Christian service which are open to us for the exercise of our basic motivation. And then the manifestational gifts, here's the Greek, anegma phonorosis, sounds like a disease. <laughs> probably mispronouncing them as well. That's the actual result in the lives of those to whom we are ministering as determined by the Holy Spirit. This is the sheet I had up there earlier. And this is just an illustration Bill gives to help us understand what he's talking about here. Okay? Let's say there was a Christian who had the gift of exhortation. That's one of the gifts enlisted in Romans 12. And he wanted to encourage, let's say he was teaching a Bible study. He wanted to encourage his hearers to gain a clear conscience. That's what his lesson was going to be about. Well, he could, or she could, look at the ministry gifts listed in Ephesians 4, That's, here's the gifts that are listed there. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, worker of power, healer, healing, helper, administration, and tongues. Now Bill suggests that if he had to choose one of these, probably the best one would be prophet. Because a prophet is a proclaimer of God's message primarily among Christians. Let's say they were all Christians that were in the study. Thus, evangelists wouldn't be a ministry he would choose because an evangelist is primarily proclaiming the gospel to non-Christians. Let's say he wasn't a pastor, but there, you know, he could use the office of teacher. So he taught this lesson, okay? How to clear your conscience based on Scripture, using the office of prophet. And let's say then you had the list there, manifestational lists, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. This is how, if he had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people in his class, and let's say each one of them received this message, and this is how they responded to it. One got a word of wisdom. For instance, he saw forgiveness from God's point of view. Another one got a word of knowledge, and that is he understood how to gain a clear conscience. Another one there got, a, got more faith, which is really visualizing what God wants someone to do regarding a clear conscience. Another one might have gotten healing. Let's say they had some physical ailments because they had a, didn't have a clear conscience. We've seen this many times in our ministry. We, we believe in anointing of oil and praying for healing uh, based on James 5 in Scripture, the elders of our ministry. And over and over again, Randy has been a part of many of these now. People come to us, you know, they have an ailment. Some are serious, like cancer. Some are uh, stomach problems, whatever it might be. And uh, we've learned over the years that most of those problems are cleared up when their conscience becomes clear. In other words, they confess their sins, they repent, 
they get right with the Lord, and those problems clear right up. And that's what could happen in this situation. Effective miracles. Prophecy. Distinguishing of spirits. Various tongues. Interpretation of tongues. So, we won't spend a lot of time on that, but that's just an illustration of how we must differentiate between the three, char uh, three uh, categories, okay? So again, here's the lists in Scripture. Romans 12, which we'll spend most of our time on. Ministries, 1 Corinthians 12, also Ephesians 4, Manifestations, 1 Corinthians 12. In fact, let me ask uh, everyone that's here now, are you following me on this? Am I making myself clear or am I confusing you? Good. No one said they're confused. When we exercise our motivational gift, out of Romans 12, through our ministry gift, or office, the Holy Spirit that determines the manifestations. That's not up to us. We just proclaim what we're supposed to proclaim using our gift, and the Holy Spirit does the rest. That's why this is so important, this next statement. We are not to seek after manifestations, as so many people do, whether it's tongues or healing. No, we're to motivate or concentrate on our motivational gift, the most effective way to use it, and again, the Holy Spirit takes care of the rest. We can't determine how the Holy Spirit's going to use our gift. We just are faithful in using it. Well, now let's turn to Romans 12, if you have your Bible. And uh, if you don't, we'll get you one on the break. Romans 12. Read these first of all, and we'll uh, go into great detail later. Starting with verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, okay, we know he's, he's writing to Christians now, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 3, For I say, through the grace, charis, given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For, as me, for we have many members in our body, you know, our hands, our feet, eyes, ears, those are all members of our physical body. Thus we also have members... And all members have not the same office, excuse me. Verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ, every member, everyone members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Now here's the seven gifts. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Number two, ministry. Verse seven, let us wait on our ministering. He that teaches is number three on teaching. He that exhorts or exhorts on exhortation. Number four, he that gives, let him do it with simplicity. He that rules, number six, with diligence. And he that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Those are the seven gifts. He uh, uses these terms. Declaring truth, serving, teaching, exhorting, giving, ruling, empathizing. Which is a strong characteristic of the gift of mercy. Now, 
each of us is commanded to perform all seven of these activities, by the way. We're all to declare truth. We're all to serve, right? Do you agree with that? We're all to teach, whether it's in a group or one-on-one. -on -one. We're all supposed to exhort. We're all supposed to give. By the way, this giving is financial giving. It's the giving of money or items. Ruling, in other words, some of us have more administration opportunities than others, but even if it's just ruling our own selves. And then, of course, we're all to show empathy or mercy. If you buy the handbook, you will see illustrations, we won't take the time now, that all seven of the gifts are commanded for all of us to do. We won't have, we won't possess all the seven gifts, but we should indeed be practicing all seven gifts. In fact, the more we can practice all seven gifts, the more mature we are. And uh, for instance, I really have to work on mercy. Uh, people close to me often remind me of that. Daniel, you're much too harsh on people. Okay. So, this is a lifelong learning process. And hopefully after today, as you understand each gift specifically, individually, you'll be able to know where you fall short. Again, that's why Jesus had all the seven gifts all the time. That's why if you get to know someone and you know this material and you don't have the opportunity to ask them if they know what their gift is, and if you can't tell, if you see them displaying all seven gifts, that shows they have great maturity, or maybe four or five of them, whatever it might be. Each of us will perform all seven of these activities, but it will also only be through our basic motivational gift. This is important. This is very important. That uh, there is a minimum of weariness and maximum effectiveness if we concentrate on what our one spiritual gift is. So often Christians want to copy or simulate some other great Christian, a Billy Graham, a John MacArthur, a Elizabeth Elliot. Well, if you don't have the same spiritual gift they have or had, and you try to do what they do or did, you'll just become burned out. That's not your gift. And uh, that's very important to remember. I became burned out early in my Christian life, back in the 80s, because I was trying to do ministry which I wasn't called to do. Now, the following scriptural uh, scripture indicates that we have only one basic motivational gift, and I want you to see this from your own Bible. First turn to 1 Peter 4.10. 1 Peter 4.10. 1 Peter is right before 2 Peter. As every man hath received the what? What does your Bible say? The gift. Does it say gifts? Gift. Singular. Because it is singular. Not gifts, but gift. And he's, he's talking about the motivational gift that we might have. Don't turn there, but Romans 12, 4 says, gifts are compared to members of the body. We already saw that. And in Romans 12, each man is to concentrate fully on the gift of God that is given him. Turn to 1 Timothy, please, chapter 4. Further proof that we only have one motivational gift. 
1 Timothy 4.14. Neglect not the gift, singular, that is in thee. And then 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift, singular. The gift. So, we are not given more than one of these gifts. Although we are to strive to exhibit all of them. Knowing each other's motivational gift coordinates and unifies Christians, we've touched on that already. Especially important between a husband and wife. Because uh, that's the closest human relationship we can have. The goal, the goal of our basic motivation is freeing other Christians to carry it on as an activity. That's why we're going to be especially sensitive to any Christian who is not exercising our motivational gift. That illustration I gave at the beginning, that's why I gave it. Uh, you may wonder, again, why if you're working with your spouse in ministry or working with other Christians and you're dealing with someone and they're not seeing the need for that person you're ministering to to respond like you are. Well, don't be hard on them, and they shouldn't be hard on you, because it's probably because your gift is different than theirs. And that's why a husband and a wife, especially we're going to look at how seven of these gifts, I'm, I'm sorry, six of them, are, are in direct opposite to each other. So if a spouse has one of these gifts and the spouse has one of those gifts, they can make a great team. Every church board, I believe, should have every one of the seven gifts represented on it. Uh, we have six members right now, and we're a little top-heavy with teachers right now. <laughs> I think at least three of the six have teaching. So all I can conclude is that's what God feels we really need on the board right now. But uh, it would be nice... You know, I often pray, Lord, it would be nice if we could have each of the gifts represented because then we really would have balance. But he hasn't chosen to uh, answer that prayer yet. Let's close this section, and we're going to take a break, by looking real briefly, and we're going to look at much more detail of the seven gifts. But this is just a kind of to whet your appetite here. On the left-hand side, we have the gifts and a brief definition. Again, prophecy or proclaiming truth. They are motivated to reveal unrighteous motives of actions by presenting God's truth. Okay? Now you're going to see, and if you remember, we read in Romans 12, or no, we didn't read in Romans 12 yet, that a short description of that gift is given. <coughs> A proclaimer must have, a, have love without hypocrisy, despise that which is evil, and grasp that which is good. How about a server? What are they motivated to do? A server? Server, or serving. Their gift is serving, or they're a server. They're motivated to demonstrate love by meeting practical needs. Okay? Okay. They have a great ability to detect personal needs, to overlook personal discomfort in order to meet those needs. But as Paul says in Romans 12, a server must have genuine affection of others, demonstrate brotherly responsibility, and be willing, other, uh, be willing to let others have the credit for what they do. Teacher, or teaching, the gift of teaching. They are motivated to clarify truth. They are motivated to search out and validate truth which has been presented by others. Thus, they enjoy engaging in research and detailed study in order to validate the truth. They will dig out the facts and accumulate knowledge. Thus, Paul says, they must be diligent in the details of their work, they must be fervent in spirit, and they must do their work as unto the Lord. Now, we all must do that, but especially the teaching. Fourth gift, exhortation. They're 
motivated to stimulate, build up the faith of others, thus primarily Christians. You can't build up the faith of a non-believer. They don't have it. Thus, they are called to the side of others to urge them to pursue a course of conduct. They enjoy personal counseling that would encourage spiritual growth. And Paul says that an exhorter must rejoice in hope, must be patient with slow progress, and be persistent in prayer. So as you listen to these, maybe this describes you or Two or three of these are describing you, or someone you know. Let's look at the last three. Giving. The person with this gift is motivated to entrust personal assets to others for the furtherance of their ministry. Not their ministry, but the ministry they're giving to. Thus, they're able to organize personal business in order to gain assets. In other words, they know how to make money. They have the ability to make quick decisions regarding the immediate needs which others have. Thus, Paul says in Romans 12, they must give freely to the total needs of fellow Christians, and they must take a genuine interest in the needs of strangers. Ruling or administration. They're motivated to coordinate the activities of others for the achievement of the common goal. They must be willing to preside over, to lead, to stand before, to distinguish major objectives, and help those around them to visualize them. Romans 12 said they must bless those who curse them. Why is this? Because administrators receive a lot of heat. So they must be able to bless those who curse them, do whatever they can to make others' lives happy and spiritually prosperous. And finally, mercy. The motivation to identify with and comfort those who are in distress. They feel empathy with the misfortunes and misery of others, to mentally and emotionally relate to their needs and give them aid. According to Paul in Romans 12, they must share in the happiness of those who are happy, and they must <laughs> enter into the grief of those who are in sorrow. Okay. End of session one. Any questions? Right. Yeah. Um, you said that we're all supposed to practice the gifts, right? Correct. All seven of them. But you said we only have one specific gift. If we don't have them gifts, how can we practice them? Because we can all show mercy. Right? Right. But that's not our motivation. We're not especially strong in that area, like myself. But we are commanded. That's why if you look in the study guide, it lists the scriptures that command us to be mercy, all of us, merciful. But we're just not motivated to do it like we are with our motivation. Now, is this, Pastor, is, is this before the law came or after Jesus died for us? After. After? Yeah. Because okay. we got the Holy Spirit living in us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you that's, know, that's the one that... Yeah. Does all this for us. Yeah. And not only that, we're right in places, right in Christ, in the heavenly places. We're sealed Amen. by the Holy Spirit, and we're blessed with all, but all blessings and everything. Amen. And Absolutely. You're right. In Christ, uh, we're seated with Him in heavenly places, so all, all the power, all power is behind us. Amen. And Satan has to back off. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, let's take a break. All right. How long is the break? Oh, how long do you want? Yeah. 10, 15 minutes. Let's do, let's go 15. Okay. Well, why do you need a sandwich, I think?